Hello, this is Chris, and this is our video on how to put a back painted glass uh, backsplash in your kitchen. A lot of people have asked us what this project is all about when we described it to them, so this video will tell you uh, pretty much how we did it. Hello, this is Chris, and this is our video on how to put a back painted glass uh, backsplash in your kitchen. A lot of people have asked us what this project is all about when we described it to them, so this video will tell you uh, pretty much how we did it. Uh, we're winging some of it, but we did as much research as we could on the internet. Not a lot of people in the US are doing this yet. So the idea is to have a single or maybe several pieces of large glass that you paint on the back and so you have a solid perfectly flat color um, for your black for your backsplash super easy to clean um, and uh, just looks really really sharp all the time uh, number one you can't necessarily just use plain old latex paint because latex paint isn't going to stick to glass quite as well as a special glass that we used uh, from glasspaint.com which is actually more of a plastic paint and is not made with uh, any uh, chemicals that you want to ever inhale. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But your first steps in doing a back painted backsplash, uh, if it's not square, you're going to have to measure very carefully all your dimensions uh, and decide how many pieces of glass you're going to do. We're going to do three. We have one large one that goes behind this area and the stove, one big one that goes uh, in front of the sink here, and one um, in the little corner over on that side. Um, that one was easy to measure because it was just a rectangle and you have to make sure that you measure top and bottom and both sides of your rectangle because you never know if your countertop is a little not level or your cabinets are a little not level. Um, you need to make sure that those dimensions are right on. You want to make some cardboard templates for that kind of thing too because you want to make sure that you size that up properly. Um, now I have used some flexible cardboard because that's what I had from our construction project of the kitchen But I recommend that you actually use corrugated or something very stiff So you cut out a template of this and then you put it against the wall and you make sure that you can slide it in Behind your cabinets without 
uh, having any obstructions. You know, you don't want to have to to angle it and then wedge it in there. Your glass isn't going to bend like cardboard. You have to get this just right. So feel free to go ahead and do several templates if you need to. The piece behind me, with uh, in front of the sink there, I needed to have a cutout for our uh, light switch and uh, the garbage disposal switch here. Again, measured very precisely. Um, you know, gave as much gap as I need to, but not not anymore. And uh, we fit this big piece of cardboard several times behind the sink to make sure that it fits just right. And I'm pretty positive now that it will fit when we put it in. So make sure you do your measurement very properly and precisely make a very, very detailed drawing to send to your glass cutting company. We had to go through three rounds of getting different pieces of glass because they kept uh, messing up. Uh, this one piece here with just had a little bump up for the microwave area. And even though we made a really precise drawing, they didn't get it right. So don't settle for something that is not exactly what you need to have. Uh, one other comment is that you can't get a thick piece of glass cut with a sharp corner on it. They're going to have to radius it. They're going to have to make that round. So you're going to have to allow for some extra space to push that round uh, corner in so you can push this piece of glass up there. Um, otherwise, you're going to have to do weird things and get your Dremel drill out and cut a, cut a thick radius in the back of your cabinet. And uh, that's something that I didn't want to do on brand new cabinets. So measure four or five or seven times. Cut three or four templates, as many templates as you need. When you get your glass back, double check your glass to the template that you made. Literally lay that piece of cardboard on top of that piece of glass and make sure it all lines up the way you need it to. And if it doesn't, make sure you send it back and tell them that you want a new piece properly cut. Um, and with that, I believe that's the end of the introduction and we're gonna get ready to actually put these pieces of glass on the wall. We've got several tubes of Gunther Premier Plus Mirror Mastic, essentially glue caulk in the tube that we're gonna put several lines on. And then we also have very important not very expensive, even if it's for one-time use. Uh, mirror, big giant mirror suction cups, so you can put a couple of these on there and then help position that piece of glass as you move it around. We'll be using these. So this piece of glass, clear starfire or low iron glass, has uh, the edges beveled off just a little bit to make it easier to handle and not cut yourself um, but you can see it's a little uneven here now at the corners once it's installed I don't think that's going to be very visible in the in the final installation but you know it's not as perfect as it really could be we had to send one of the pieces back because it was beveled way too far and very sloppily by hand obviously and it's not the companies like this couldn't do a good job I mean, this is reasonably decent. It's only a millimeter or two beveled at the corner. It's not quite as great. But then they had cut out the uh, cut out for um, for our switches here, and uh, the guy said they use the water jet cutter. And uh, boy, this edge is just absolutely perfect. Um, there's no there's no bevel on it at all. And uh, but it's not it's not sharp. You know, I can run my finger on there a little bit without, without cutting myself, and uh, the quality of it is just beautiful. Um, and you know, the, the sad thing is this is going to be covered up by the light switch cover then anyways, so we're not going to, we're not going to see that, but, um, you know, if you're uh, specking out a very custom shape, or um, even something like we had, we had to have a, a notch here for where a microwave goes, um, and clearly, you know, they may have water jet cut of this whole piece but then they just and they just beveled the outside by hand there um, a little a little funny and sloppy so it is it is possible to get a really nice piece um, but just need to make sure your person that's supplying the company that's supplying the glass is going to do a really nice job and uh, use a nice water jet cutter for your for you to get a, a nice um, a nice corner there and of course the other thing is you're not going to get a perfectly 90 degree um, zero uh, millimeter radius on this stuff they had told us that um, they need to have a radius that's as big as the thickness of the glass so this is a 3 8 inch glass and the uh, the radius of this corner here is 3 8 of an inch so you don't get cracks or splinters in there either for manufacturing or if you handle a little bit and tweak it 
it'd be very easy to get a crack right there uh, if it wasn't radius like that. So you are going to have to take this into effect, into account uh, when you're making your uh, dimensions and your template for getting this cut because you're going to have to have a little bit of a gap to your cabinets or a wall or whatever here because of this radius and I mean unless you want to radius the bottom edge of your cabinets to fit that but uh, I did not so we just are going to have like a about a three-eighths or a quarter inch gap side to side where this goes up against the cabinetry. So we need to clean the glass and the first thing that you want to do is use a quadruple zero steel wool pad and scrub the side of the glass that you're going to paint uh, very firmly to get any contaminants and dirt and that kind of stuff off. And then we're going to clean it with alcohol and uh, paper towels and your goal is to get it as perfectly clean as possible. It is the most important step to have a perfect finish is for this to be as clean as possible. It would also help to put a black or dark color underneath of your glass so you can see any fingerprints or smudges on the side that you're cleaning. When your glass is all clean and you have gloves on, you want to put masking tape around the edge because you need to kind of keep the paint inside the uh, area of the glass. And of course, you don't want to paint the edge because that's not going to have the kind of look you want. You want the edge to be clear. And so you need to make a little dam around all the edges, including the inside cuts. All right, we're almost ready to paint. Our glass is clean. We've taped up the edges. We have it in a place where we're gonna easily be able to work on it. You're gonna need foam rollers, not rollers that have a uh, nap on them like, like uh, cloth or cotton. They need to be foam because you don't want particles stuck in this paint. You need to have a container that has a graduated measuring on the side of it that you can throw away. These kind of one quart uh, containers worked perfectly and of course they're measurable so you can measure out the correct quantity of the glass paint and the catalyst that goes along with it. And with that here comes the glass primer, two parts, one gallon of paint and a jar, a bottle of the catalyst which will make it harden and turn it into a plastic like material. So this is what the bottles uh, and cans look like when you get them and this is a material you're going to be ready to work with. This paint has the strongest fumes I have ever experienced in my life. You need a full on automotive painter's mask to stop the fumes. If you don't have something like that, it's almost irrelevant. Those white little masks uh, for dust and stuff that you get at Lowe's or Home Depot or the hardware store, they're irrelevant. They're not gonna stop any of these fumes. I do suggest if you're able to hold your nose and breathe out your mouth at the same time you do that because I've read that you're Your nerves in your nose go more directly to your brain than anything else. So you don't want these fumes going straight to your brain. My graduated cup, gonna make a little bit bigger batch today than before. Make sure you got everything you need, rags, stuff, prepped and ready to go. keep things clean but there's not much point in trying to save this paint because I'm likely never going to be using it again for another project. So if I make too much and don't use it all that is just fine. About 21 ounces of that paint. We're going to add the catalyst. Catalyst doesn't have much odor to it, but it is clear and thick and gloopy. I mean, it's a catalyst. It actually makes this stuff turn into solidified plastic. 
it's a little difficult to measure because it goes in so slowly it takes a moment to even out on the top of the paint jar here. Back on that shit. There's our catalyst you can see here. The catalyst is clear. There, now the stuff needs mixed up really good. The stuff says if you need to clean it up with anything to use acetone. I do not have acetone readily available to me. Actually, I don't have any acetone. Um, and you're working with really harsh chemicals in the first place. You don't want to work with acetone or this kind of paint without using gloves, blue gloves, nitrile gloves, or latex gloves uh, of some kind. Good ventilation. I've got the door to my workshop open to the outside. I've got uh, a window fan trying to push some air in. I've got a ceiling fan running right now. Uh, the recommended application, the glass primer, the instructions say to use is uh, spray on, and I do agree with that. If you can spray it on, you could use one of the uh, no air sprayers, like for house paint, but then again, you're gonna have to clean that out immediately as soon as you're done spraying. You can't even let the stuff sit in a sprayer for five minutes because it's just gonna start to, uh, I'll say, dry or catalyze or harden inside your sprayer. You would need to clean it out immediately, and this is going to be the uh, fourth coat that I'm actually putting on because yellow is a little, uh, you know, a little on the weak side as far as opacity uh, goes. Most artists should know that. <clears throat> and then after I'm done with the fourth coat and let it cure again for uh, several days, maybe to a week even, we're going to go and put some white spray paint on the back to um, further. Uh, Make sure that the opacity, the opaqueness of the yellow is, is fully opaque and nothing is going to show through. There we are, fully mixed up. I mean, it just looks like yellow half paint. Except it smells like a Sharpie factory times a million. Here is me applying the first coat of paint, actually even though the previous segment said I was putting on the fourth coat, just kind of recorded some of this out of order. Putting the first coat on was a little challenging because you do need to put it on uh, kind of thick. It doesn't go very far once you roll it out and you do want to have a good enough thick coat the first time so you don't get many uh, light spots or weak spots or holes uh, in your coverage because the first coat is the most important coat to do to make sure it goes on very smoothly. Now I'm going to get a foam uh, uh, regular brush and I'm going to be filling in the corners here and you want to make sure that you fill in the corners very fully and there's not a gap you don't want to have a, a morse code dot dot dash dash kind of effect going on because you will be able to see that edge uh, along the bottom where it meets up to your uh, countertop you want that uh, edge to be filled in really smooth and really evenly um, so you don't uh, you don't get a, a dash or gap effect there so make sure you uh, put the paint on uh, kind of thick uh, in the first place and you don't have to worry about it drying so much like as I said it's going to be catalyzing here I am uh, cleaning up a little sp spot where I had some smudges from my finger and make sure I clean that really well um, part way through painting here and now I'm gonna finish up putting paint in the edge there and finish up this part so I just finished rolling this paint here. Let's have a close look. You can see that the surface is not as smooth as, as you'd expect it, even using the foam roller. Um, there's some light areas there, and you saw I didn't get up, I didn't get up to the very edge uh, on that one piece. And here's the other piece. You know, I put it very thick around the bottom edge, uh, and here you can see it uh, you know, has some thin spots and some overlapping spots, but just the first coat, that's okay. This will be fixed on subsequent coats and it, as it gets filled in. Hey there, so this is the morning after painting the glass paint onto our three pieces of glass. Let's take a look and see how this has cured and dried overnight. So the first thing that I noticed is everything has solidified and the pieces of glass are dried really nicely. Now I say dried, but actually they, they catalyzed or solidified. Here's the foam roller that I used last night. So it's, it's, um, it's about 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday and yesterday on Friday I was applying this, quote, painting this 
at a, between um, 7 and 10 o'clock at night, so it's at least 14 uh, hours, 16 hours later. And this is, this foam roller is solid. I can, I can't push my finger in it at all. It has turned into a solid piece of plastic. You can see how the edges here, where I had some uh, saran wrap on it, uh, have just taken the shape of it. So this does, stuff doesn't so much dry as it solidifies. It's plasticized and catalyzed. I put three coats on last night. The first coat was, was pretty thin. It just um, wouldn't stick really well. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty thick material, but it just didn't stick to the surface really well. And I didn't want to put too thick of a coat on it first. But you can see on my tape edges here, it's totally dried up. I'm pushing my finger into it. I can't even really get much of a dent using my fingernail on the plastic here. It's dried after my third coat. I put a pretty heavy third coat on and uh, you can see the kind of the, the gloss on it, the sheen. It did start getting a textured effect. Um, you know, it's not really showing up on the glass side very much, but it is it's very thick and um, it does seem reasonably uh, opaque. There are still some transparent areas here. Um, it's probably not sure how how well this is going to show up here. So yeah, you can see it didn't lay down super smooth. It kind of has little little rivulets here that are thicker and thinner, but it is pretty much dried. Uh, the surface has gotten uh, just a tad bit, um, I'll call it crazed, for uh, people that have done painting before. Um, right there in the in the in the highlight area. Where's my finger? Can't even see where my finger is here. Right, right, right there. Right there. It's become a little funny and speckled um, from drying. And I did have the dehumidifier running to get the humidity in my room down to 50%. Or actually went down a little to a little bit less than that uh, overnight. But uh, it appears that all the pieces have cured properly. And uh, this stuff is uh, really something else, but holy god, the fumes are strong. You've got to ventilate the room. You cannot do this in a non-ventilated room. It must be ventilated. Um, well, when you have the doors wide open, this kind of thing happens. I guess the fumes just knocked this little skeeter out and just fell right on to the paints. And I've tried pulling a couple of his legs off, but he's going to have to stay there until it cures. All right, this is coat number four. I laid it on pretty thick. You know, it's dangerous to put paint on too thick sometimes because it just uh, will take a long time to cure or it could start uh, shrinking and cracking and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, we're gonna take a little chance with this. It looks like it did okay before uh, it's been cured for a good 36 hours, uh, which it says uh, curing is between 24 and 72 hours in optimal conditions and it was low humidity when I was curing it before and uh, you can see the the surface is pretty ripply even though I put it on tried to hope you know just hope that it would even out as I laid it on I, I laid it on pretty thick in these quarters I'm gonna have a lot of trimming to do with the knife to cut that to cut that giant quarter off to cut that blue tape off uh, as well um, but uh, it looks very filled in I don't see many areas where I see uh, a bluish tint coming through it which would uh, mean it's kind of thin and uh, it would be a little on the transparent side so uh, this last coat only took me about 20 minutes to slather on and uh, I'm gonna have to close the door and crank the humidifier on for a while because we're up to 60% humidity right now in here and I'm gonna get myself out of this room to spare myself from any more fumigation so after everything is cured, you're going to peel your paint off and you're going to actually have to get a ridge blade to help pull this off because it's plastic and the edges are going to be essentially welded together. So you're going to use a big utility knife and carefully cut and pull the tape at the same time so you have a nice sharp edge 
uh, where you peel your paint off. You don't want to peel this off the back of your glass, of course. You want to keep that on there. And like I said, you want to use a paintbrush and fill in the edge right up to the tape so you don't get this dot effect like you see here. This is going to show up and look kind of bad on the final product, so make sure you fill in thicker than this. We're going to clean the bottom edge of this piece of glass with alcohol and we're going to put a thin strip of um, essentially a clear silicone on the bottom to give it just a smidge of padding when the glass sits on top of the countertop so we don't want glass sitting on stone and you know houses uh, do move around a little bit so over time we don't want this to scratch and potentially make some friction and then cause a little break or anything. So um, this is a half inch clear acrylic from C.R. Lawrence, ordered it on Amazon. This C.R. Lawrence doesn't sell direct. First piece is in, just be careful with that tape on the bottom, it is very sticky on both sides. So I had to try to lift that piece up and walk it over about three millimeters. So for the next one I'll know, I thought perhaps the other side was well, it was not sticky, uh, but just had protective covering on it. Um, so I'll make sure the next one, um, so we, we have taken out the, taken off the uh, faucet so we can put this, we'll have to put it straight in because it's gonna slide right between these two cabinets really precisely and push it back. So as you can see, we had quite a problem getting that piece in, even though I had measured it five times and had a template. Why? Because the faces of these cabinets are each one or two millimeters out from the very sides of the cabinets, and I did not take that into account. Now, if you were doing this before you put your sink on or you took your sink off totally, you'd be set, no problem. You could wiggle it around. So we had this problem, I mean, I knew we were taking the sink off so we could have more room to work in the first place, but uh, definitely consider every little dimension like that before you get your measurements and you get your
so uh, this project has been four months in the making, I mean including the uh, concept of doing this in the kitchen, and uh, it was about five or six weeks until we got our glass from when we placed the order. It took two weeks for the first time, two weeks again, two weeks again until we got it right. So the third time, uh, painting the uh, glass paint on the back uh, took a full week because I wanted to let it cure uh, really fully um, in the workshop. So I didn't rush that part. And uh, here we are. Now this will set up. We'll let this dry for a day. Eat out of the microwave, not out of the stove. <laughs> And um, then I'll just have to, I'll just go back and uh, do the caulk around the edges. Uh, we have this, like we figured might happen, the middle piece and the piece that goes behind the stove are, are different heights, they're different uh, depths away from the wall because this has a, clearly there's a big high spot, a bump right here in the middle of this wall. And then the other wall over there uh, does not, or, or it's just shaped a little differently, all being out of square. It seems like it slopes away from the glass right behind the stove, but it's tight to the it's tight to the glass uh, closer here. So there's not much you can do about that unless you uh, really wanted to to shim it up and, and test fit it a bunch of times. And uh, we just didn't really think that was completely necessary. Uh, for the quality of the job that we needed to do. We like it nice, but this has been a long time coming. We just want to get this done to have our kitchen officially finished. And there's no way we could have done this with a single pane of glass. Not really. That's correct. Multiple panes of glass. If you just want to put a piece like this just behind your stove, go for it. You can get a piece of glass, uh, you know, for maybe a hundred dollars or less. Um, but we paid over $700 for these um, three pieces of custom cut glass. So uh, it's not inexpensive if you need custom pieces, but if you just need square pieces or can somehow configure it that you only need square pieces and maybe one hole for a light switch or something like that, uh, it's probably your best bet. So this isn't the most cost-effective project ever, uh, but it does look nice when it's done. Of course we need to put silicone caulk around the edges of our glass and of course where the glass meets the countertop and uh, if you are not a caulking expert I completely and highly recommend that you tape off your caulk and if you haven't done it like this before you put your caulk in here and then you can run your finger along here to smooth it out and then before it's cured uh, as in uh, almost immediately pull off the tape and then you'll have a nice sharp straight edge uh, for your caulk line instead of a wavy blobby mess because nobody wants to see that. So uh, just to give you a concrete example of what I m meant when I said that you have to make sure if you have a cutout you need to make sure it's, uh, there's space for it to be rounded off. So here's where the microwave sits up about an inch and a half higher than the cabinets and when we had the glass cut you can see it had to be cut with this rounded edge here so now there's this uh, on this side, three-eighths gap or so between the uh, glass and this cabinet. And uh, of course we gave ourselves just enough working room under the bottom of the cabinet to the glass to make sure it fit right. So you might have to make some little affordances for ease of fitment when you have your glass cut. So don't forget that when you put your glass on, now you're uh, face of your walls are going to be three-eighths or a half an inch thicker and uh, you're going to have to get some spacers and probably some longer screws for your receptacles and outlets like this so I'm going to need to go and get I know they make uh, little spacers that are just rectangles that you can fit here um, or just little uh, standoffs um, in the hardware section and some uh, longer screws in case your screws that go through here are kind of short and you're going to want to have the much larger style of uh, cover if you just get the white or the black uh, or the gray covers that go around here because obviously this is going to be cut a little bit larger than your original outlet box and you're going to want to have a cover that goes out far enough that you don't see any um, rough edges or kind of weird painted pieces um, that happen to be right on the edge of the glass there so get a little bit bigger cover and it'll cover up nicely. <laughs> 